Welcome to Math with Professor V. In this video, we're going to learn about the squeeze theorem, which is one of the trickiest theorems for students when it comes to limits. And to understand the idea, I want you guys to imagine a river that's getting narrower as it flows towards a point. Now, if you drop a leaf in the middle, you don't have to track its exact path because as the river banks converge to the same place, the little leaf has no choice but to follow or head towards the same limit. And that's exactly what the squeeze theorem tells us. If two functions on either side of another function are both heading toward the same limit, then the one in the middle is forced to go there too. Now I know this theorem can feel abstract at first, but in this video, I'm gonna walk you through examples step by step, both limits where x approaches a constant and limits where x goes to infinity. And by the end, you'll feel confident applying the squeeze theorem in your calculus class or on an AP calculus exam. So let's review the statement of the squeeze theorem and then dive into the four examples I have prepared for you. So here's the formal statement. If f of x is less than or equal to g of x is less than or equal to h of x when x is near a, except possibly at a, and if the limit as x approaches a of f of x, that's the lower bound function, and the limit as x approaches a of h of x are the same, they both equal out, h of x is the upper bound function, then the limit as x approaches a of g of x is equal to l. So here's another illustration, just the riverbank turned on its side basically. So you have some function whose limit you can find as x approaches a, another function whose limit you can find as x approaches a, and here's g, we don't know g's limit, the pink one, this is our leaf. If we can squeeze, g of x between two other functions whose limits we know and are equal, then g has no choice but to approach the same value. Also, this statement works if x approaches infinity. I'm not gonna rewrite it because it's basically the same thing. So right here, what's the hardest part of this problem for students? You have to come up with this inequality, and that's tricky to do. But the good thing is, at this point in your calculus career, almost every single squeeze theorem problem is gonna involve sine theta or cosine theta. Why? Because they're easily bounded. You can always say sine theta is between one and negative one inclusive, and you can say the same thing for cosine theta, okay? So that's a big clue that it's gonna be time to use the squeeze theorem. It, it doesn't always have to be that way, but believe me, it, it's gonna to be too convoluted. We're just in Calc 1, so just remind yourself they're not gonna pull anything too extreme on you. So let's practice, here we go. Evaluate the following limits. We need the limit as x approaches zero of x to the fourth times cosine of two over x. Now, how do I know it's even time to use the squeeze theorem? Like why wouldn't direct substitution work? Well, as x approaches zero, we know x to the fourth is approaching zero. And then two over x, a constant over something shrinking, 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 approaches either positive or negative infinity. And we have cosine of that quantity. Well, cosine's graph oscillates. So as x approaches infinity or negative infinity, this whole term here is just wiggling around. So its limit doesn't exist. So if you have zero times something that doesn't exist, you can't evaluate the limit. Now, it doesn't exist, but it's bounded, which is why this is a perfect, perfect problem on which we can use the squeeze theorem. So here we go. Here we go. So how do you start? Writing the inequality is the scariest part, but I got you. You identify the trig function. Yes, there will always be a trig function for the most part. So here it is, cosine two over x. That's what we're bounding. I just said a second ago, we always know cosine theta is between one and negative one, right? Okay, well this time we don't have cosine theta, we have cosine two over x. Okay, no big deal, just swap her out. Cosine two over x, that's my theta in this problem, is less than or equal to one, greater than or equal to negative one. How are we doing? Okay, our goal, our goal, is to make this function here, the one being squeezed or sandwiched in the inequality, to match what we're trying to take the limit of. So we've got the cosine two over x, yes we do. What's missing? x to the fourth. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna come through now and multiply everybody in this inequality by x to the fourth. Now you might say, wait, Professor V, this feels like a dangerous moment because if we multiply an inequality through by negative quantity, we have to flip the direction of the inequality. You're right, but 
thankfully they gave us x to the fourth, which is always gonna be positive, right? It's not negative. So then I don't have to worry about these flipping. Okay, good. So let's multiply through negative one times x to the fourth. That's negative x to the fourth. Now I have x to the fourth cosine two over x right here is less than or equal to one times x to the fourth. So look back at your squeeze theorem statement. I have the inequality that I needed. Look, look, look. We need to have f of x less than or equal to g of x less than or equal to h of x. Here's my f of x. This is g of x, whose limit we're finding in the problem, and then this is h of x. It doesn't matter what you call each of them, but you just need to set up this situation right here. Okay, then now we take the limit of only the lower bound and upper bound functions. So we're gonna take the limit. What limit do I take? Look at the problem. We're interested in x going to zero of negative x to the fourth. Oh, this is relaxing. We can just use direct substitution. Just plug in zero, you get zero. Okay, perfect. And we also take the limit of the upper bound function. Limit as whatever the problem's asking you for. In this case, x goes to zero of x to the fourth. Again, direct substitution. And lo and behold, these limits are equal. So then what do we say? This implies that the limit of x to the fourth cosine two over x as x approaches zero also equals zero by the squeeze theorem. And yes, you do need to say by the squeeze theorem every single time. It's kind of like citing your sources. When you use a theorem that has a name in math, you should cite it. If it's like theorem 2.3.4, no, don't worry about that one. But if it has a name, then yes, cite it when you use it, okay? That's it, this will get you full credit. So some things to remember, okay? The limit from the function bounding below and above have to be the same in order for you to apply the squeeze theorem. Um, it won't work if they're not the same. So that probably means then you set your inequality up wrong or whatever. And then also just always start by bounding the trig function, okay? Let's do a few more. Once you get the hang of them, they're gonna be repetitive. You're gonna be like, oh, this old problem. I hope they put a squeeze theorem on there. Okay, I wanted to dig up something scary just to you know, freak you out. So this is essentially the same problem that we just did. It's just everything's been shifted over. I didn't want it to be too boring because a lot of the times the squeeze theorem problems always go to zero. Um, so we have the limit x goes to pi of x minus pi squared times sine of one over x minus pi. And if you try direct substitution, again, you get zero, this approaches infinity, so this will oscillate, so it's time for the squeeze theorem. So where do you start? No panic attacks, you just hone in on the trig function. It's gonna be sine or cosine. Those are the only two that are easily bounded. The other trig functions don't behave nicely for us. Okay, so we know sine of, you don't have to write this first step, but if it just makes you feel better, do it. Sine of theta is always between negative one and one inclusive. So then just swap out theta for whatever's in the problem. In this case, one over x minus pi. Beautiful. Less than or equal to one, greater than or equal to negative one. Then you go, okay, my goal is to make this function that's bounded in the middle of the inequality match whatever I'm trying to take the limit of. So what's this missing? It's missing all of this, x minus pi squared. Okay, no problem. So we multiply the whole inequality by x minus pi squared, which thankfully is positive, right? Because it's squared, so the direction of the inequalities are preserved. So I'll have negative one times x minus pi squared is less than or equal to x minus pi squared times sine of one over x minus pi is less than or equal to one times x minus pi squared. Perfect, then you go, oh wait, did I set up the correct inequality? The function whose limit I'm trying to find is sandwiched or squeezed in the middle? Perfect, now I just gotta make sure if I take the limit, in this case, as x approaches, look at what the problem says, pi, right? The problem said as x approaches pi. Okay, of this lower bounding function, negative x minus pi squared, well, you just plug it in, right? Negative pi minus pi squared, yep, that's zero. And we do the same thing for the function up here. Limit, again, x goes to pi, that's where the problem told us to go. x minus pi squared, this is zero. 
they're matchy matchy as they had better be, then this tells us that the limit of the function in between as x goes to pi of x minus pi squared sine of one over x minus pi equals zero also by the squeeze theorem. Okay, how was that one? I thought it was a good one to practice just so you could see the limit could go somewhere else. Okay, okay, example three. I think this one looks like it's the spiciest of them all. The limit as x approaches zero from the right of the square root of x times e raised to the sine of pi over x. Woo, okay, again, I like always try direct substitution first. We know this is a squeeze theorem video, but like your default when you're looking at limits should be to try direct substitution. So yeah, this is gonna go to zero, e raised to the sine of, uh-oh, pi over something getting small, this is getting big, this doesn't exist. Okay, so you can't get a number just by plugging in zero for x. We've confirmed that. Now, yes, it is squeeze theorem time. It looks really frightening. Again, no meltdowns. What did I tell you? Identify the trig function. Just start from there. Just start from there. Okay, so we know sine of theta is always less than or equal to 1, greater than or equal to negative 1. Well, we don't have theta. We have pi over x. Okay, just swap it out. Sine of pi over x is less than or equal to 1, greater than or equal to negative 1. Beautiful. Okay, this one, woo, it has e raised to the sine of pi over x. So we're just going to exponentiate everything through the inequality. Is that allowed, Professor V? Are the math police going to come get me? It's very much so allowed. e is a one-to-one -one function. So you are allowed to do this. So e to the negative first is less than or equal to e raised to the sine of pi over x is less than or equal to e to the first. Are we good? Perfect. Okay, remember, goal is make this match the function whose limit we're trying to find here. We're almost there. What's missing? Just this squared x. Okay, perfect. So we're going to come through, multiply everybody in the inequality by square root of x. Square root of x is never negative, so we don't have to worry about flipping these or anything getting messed up. Perfect. So we have e to the negative first, that's the same as just one over e, right? It's a constant. Square root of x is less than or equal to square root of x e raised to the sine of pi over x is less than or equal to, again, this is just a constant e times square root of x. Perfect, so we've set up our inequality. What's bounded in the middle is what I'm trying to find the limit of. Now, we're gonna take the limit of the lower bound and upper bound functions. So we're gonna check what's the limit, in this case, as x approaches zero from the right. Why from the right? Because they said so here. And also we have to approach zero from the right because otherwise we would not be in the domain for square root of x. Square root of x only exists from zero to positive infinity. Remember what it looks like? Yes, you do, oh good, square root of x. Sloppy graph right here. So it's only possible to approach it from the right side. Okay, one over e times square root of x. You can just use direct substitution. It's one over e times the square root of zero, which is zero. And we take the limit of the upper bound function. It doesn't matter that we're approaching zero from the right in terms of when you do direct substitution. You still just plug in zero, okay? It's just for the sake of making sure that the limit's gonna be defined or that it's possible to evaluate. E time, like don't put like 0.1. No, you just plug in zero. Okay, perfect. Fabulous. They're the same. They're both zero. So what does this tell me? That the limit as x approaches zero from the right of the square root of x times e raised to the sine of pi over x equals zero also by the squeeze there. See, it's not bad. Once you get the hang of it, it can just look frightening and the steps are intimidating. But once you learn how to set up that inequality, you're in business. Okay, I did mention you can also do these for limits that go to infinity. Okay, so here we go. Later, when you learn um, other limit laws, you might have other ways of doing them, but this works great. So limit as x goes to infinity of sine x over x. Again, why doesn't direct substitution work? Well, as x goes to infinity, the numerator's just oscillating 
and then the denominator is going to infinity. So direct substitution doesn't give us a value that we can use. So again, we're going to use a squeeze theorem. Sine of x is easily bounded between 1 and negative 1. And then you go, okay, I need to make this match what I'm trying to take the limit of. So I'm going to divide through by x. Do I have to worry that x could be negative? No, because we're approaching positive infinity, not negative infinity. Okay, so then from here, let's evaluate the limit as x goes to infinity of negative 1 over x. That's going to be 0. And let's evaluate the limit as x goes to positive infinity of positive 1 over x. That's also 0. Constant over infinity goes to 0. So then this tells me the limit as x approaches infinity of sine of x over x equals 0 also by the squeeze theorem. You know, I realized since I divided the original inequality, it looks like we did no work. Don't do that on your AP test. I would go like this and then be like times 1 over x. Then we get there. Show all your work. I was a paranoid little student. And just think of it this way. I don't want them to think I guessed. If I thought something through, I want to show it on my exam. I want to show it to my professor. You know, if there's something that crossed your mind in your solution process, let them know. Don't hide it. Be proud of all the studying that you did. So don't make it difficult for them to assess your understanding. Okay, that's it. I hope the video was helpful. I hope you feel like you're ready to tackle the squeeze theorem because let me tell you, I had a request and my students usually freak out about it all the time. So it was high time it had its own dedicated video. Now, if you found this video helpful, don't forget to subscribe and hit that like button. And then you can check out my full Calculus 1 videos lectures playlist. If you're preparing for your AP Calculus exam, I've also organized everything by AP unit so you can find exactly what you need. And you can also follow me on TikTok, Instagram, and check out my Patreon for more practice problems and exclusive content. Thanks for watching so much. I'll be back sooner than later.